When my father died at age 49 after a long illness, he left behind a wife who had never worked outside of the home and a family of five children. I was the oldest, a junior in college. My twin brothers, the youngest of the five of us, was, they, were, they were 15. You might assume that experiencing my father's death was the worst thing that I had experienced in my 21 years of life. And on that day, perhaps it really was. But it was also the day that I made an amazing discovery about the women of my family. My mother, my aunts on both sides of my family, my, both of my grandmothers, my great-grandmother, my sister and me. I discovered on that day the women who raised and shaped me came from a long and proud line of strong, capable, and resilient women. And all that untapped potential, talent, and ambition lurking inside of each of us women, it took but a small invitation to burst into view and to blossom in a brand new way. After the funeral, it didn't take long for mom to find work outside of the home and not that much longer for her to turn that work into buying and successfully running a business as a sole proprietor. Her earnings covered our household needs, but us five kids quickly figured out that if we wanted clean clothes and a warm supper, we'd better learn to do laundry and read a recipe. It also, frankly, poked me into redoubling my efforts to earn my diploma, study for my master's degree, and find sustaining work. Those early years in my adult life influence me still all this many years later. And each time I have the opportunity to preach on the strength, insight, and gifted women of the Bible, well, I jump at the chance. You know, a good friend of mine this week reminded me that the Bible was written largely by men for men. Guys, don't worry, we still love you all very much. But this morning I'd like to give Mary, the mother of Jesus, a chance to shine. The first century woman, Jewish woman named Miriam of Nazareth, mother of Jesus, is the most celebrated female religious figure in the Christian tradition. She is the symbol of the maternal face of God, of the eternal feminine, of the disciple, and perhaps even the idealized church. The Lutheran church's theology is not Marian in its orientation, but my own Roman upbringing gives me reason to be fascinated by her and love her very much. The diversity and depth in this woman's character begins in Scripture, where each of the four Gospels portray her in a different way based on their own theological perspectives. Within the Gospels, there are 13 scenes where Miriam of Nazareth, identified either by her name or as the mother of Jesus, speaks, takes action, or is described as an essential part of what's going on at that particular moment. Drawing on these various gospel portraits then gives us different glimpses or brief portrayals of who Miriam was. And in today's gospel from Luke, Miriam takes the form of a young, pregnant woman singing a prophetic song. And by young, I mean perhaps she was 13 or 14, maybe 15. Now, less well-known and less used in the liturgical work of the church is the ancient song of Hannah that Greg read earlier. Hannah was the mother of the prophet Samuel. 
written centuries apart, the Song of Hannah and the Song of Miriam are related. Both Hannah and Miriam are mothers rejoicing at the birth of an unexpected child. Hannah praises God that he has seen fit to end the curse of her barrenness, and Mary glorifies the Lord because God has chosen her to bear the promised Messiah. Each, to their own sorrow, knew that she would have to give up her son one day. And still, each woman's story gives us a sense of so much hope in a very difficult world, difficult then and difficult now. Miriam's song is the most any woman gets to say in Christian scripture. While pregnant with Jesus and visiting similarly pregnant Elizabeth, Mary sings the Magnificat. It is the most in-depth glimpse of, we have of Miriam and opens a window, I believe, to her very soul. I adore this canticle not only for its beautiful Im imagery and for its liberated theology, but it also allows us to see all of whom Mary, Miriam was. And in my view, this is not Miriam meek, mild, and innocent. This song is sung in the context of two pregnant women not discussing their motherhood, their fears of giving birth, their apprehension, the weariness of the pregnancies or the joys when those occur. Miriam's song is sung in the context of two pregnant women passionately discussing the coming overthrow of the earthly Roman Empire. Almighty God might have chosen an economically poor, marginalized girl to bear the Christ child, but God didn't choose someone who had been lost in the woods. Miriam was wise, and she loved and feared God. That is, she was in awe of God. And when her life was changed by the coming of the messenger of God, she had both the words and the spirit that she needed coming directly from God from which to respond to the mighty blessing that God bestowed upon her. She had words of joy and thankfulness and frankly a little sassy rebellion. Martin Luther saw Mary's song, Miriam's song, as a model for Christian prayer and praise. And in the same way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologians who died at the hands of the Third Reich, preached, the song of Miriam is the oldest Advent hymn. It is at once the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary Advent hymn ever sung. This is not the gentle, tender, dreamy Mary whom we sometimes see in paintings. This is the passionate, surrendered, proud, enthusiastic Miriam who speaks out in this canticle. And just because I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he continues, this song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, even playful tones of some of our Christmas carols. Instead, it is a hard, strong, unavoidable song about collapsing thrones and humbled lords of this world. It is about the power of God and the powerlessness of humankind. These are the tones of the women prophets of the Old Testament that now come to life in Mary's mouth. 
Mary begins her song with the wonder she feels at what God's distinguishing grace has done for her. My soul magnifies my God, she starts. You know, Mary needs a savior just like you and I need a savior, a redeemer, a friend, a guide, a teacher. Mary sees herself as a sinner, and aren't we all? Miriam sings a song of the redeemed with the assurance that she is a child of God. She knows the gospel dynamics very well. Grace is followed by gratitude. Fully recognizing the saving power of life, death, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus, Miriam's song is, for me, in the midst of my own weariness of this year, the own, my own sorrow that I have experienced, but also my energy and joy. Of this time of year, Miriam's song is the most hopeful passage in all of Scripture. It has guided us through the centuries. When Miriam sings to the poor, the hungry, the homeless, and who among us has never experienced physically or metaphorically the feelings of hunger, loss, loneliness? I pray people of every culture, in every time and every place, can hear the blessings of Miriam's canticle. Miriam's song resonates throughout all of history, urging us all toward God's realm in which we are all loved, all are cared for, and all are brought into community. The despotic rulers of Guatemala in the 1980s recognized the subversive nature of Miriam's song, and the government found Miriam's proclamation that we read this morning that God is concerned especially for the marginalized and the poor to be so dangerous and so revolutionary that they banned it from any public recitation. I wonder if you've heard the story of Dottie Stevens, a poor mother who became a mom at age 16 she worked her entire life as a fighter, survivor, and organizer of the poor. She fought her entire life for the rights of the dispossessed. She stood up for the marginalized and spoke her truth. She heard Miriam's song and put the words into action, working to enable mothers to feed their children and heat their homes in the winter. The God Miriam celebrates reminds us today, this day, our work begins here and now. Today, Miriam's song fills us with hope and satisfies our needs, even in a weary world. Dear people of West Lynn Lutheran, we are all beloved. And when the poor are honored and those who have so much are brought down, then we pray, everyone will have enough and no one has too much. We pray every person is treated with dignity and respect and no one uses their power to harm anyone else. Miriam's song magnifies the Savior who loves the whole world, not just part of it, the whole world, with a love that makes creation whole. What made Miriam sing, my soul magnifies my God and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior? Well, it was her faith. It was grace. God's saving redemption is for all of us. God's covenant 
and promise made to Abraham has been fulfilled. And the mother and all of us have received God's blessing. Amen.